start mine right now. Um, if someone has space, if not, that's okay. Uh, I don't. Okay. I cleared space on my computer, so hopefully it should work. And if it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. I'm overdue. I need to, I need to put some stuff on my hard drive. <sighs> All right. Five, four, three. No, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. So you said, like, you, so you're going to unmute the first three people. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it'll be fine no matter how okay. it goes. I'll, I'll, I'll just, yeah, I'll go off here. I'll see you here. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that, like, you know, sat, like how we do the Saturday things where it's, like, all seamless. Like, it's fine if we're, like, wait, is so-and-so unmuted? Like, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Should we open the room? Uh, yeah, I'll let people in. Good to go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. Nice to see you all. See some familiar faces here tonight. <laughs> um, yeah. Hi. Welcome to the Animal Liberation Online Assembly. Um, we're here for the last training of this series. It's like bittersweet, and it's felt like forever, but also I feel like we just started yesterday. So for those of you who've been with us on many of these calls, maybe some of that resonates with you. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to, to share this content with everyone today. And um, we're just gonna wait a couple minutes while people, um, while we just wait for everyone to join and find the link. And um, if you are moving around or um, you know walking around somewhere, the, this training will be the best experience for you if you're kind of sitting and you're able to see. Um, it's you know great if you can turn your video on as well just to give us more of a sense of, of being together. Um, we're gonna be using the chat and later in the call, I'll be asking for some volunteers as well to participate in some um, little activities. So if you are you know up and moving around or you wanna just take a couple minutes right now to find a place where you can like sit down and really just focus, um, that will be the best experience for you. So feel free to do that. And if you need to switch devices or something like that, um, we'll let you back in from the waiting room. So no worries on that. Um, my name's Joanna. I am uh, one of the organizers of the online assembly and I'm gonna be facilitating or leading, facilitating the workshop on facilitation. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get started here. And um, before we jump in, I thought maybe we could just all spend a couple minutes finding the chat. I sh I'm sure a lot of you know where it is. Um, you can probably find on the bottom bar a little button that says chat on it and um, you can find the chat there and that's where a main area will you where you'll be able to participate and interact with each other. And um, I thought we could just start off with a little check-in right now in the chat. So just, you know, let me know how you're doing. Um, if there's something on your mind uh, or something that you're bringing into the training that is just kind of weighing on you. Um, let's just, you know, kind of take a second here to, to see and hear each other. <laughs> Haru says, hi, kitty. <laughs> and that they love you. Um, Rob love says, you doing okay. <laughs> Rob says doing okay well okay is you know better than than not okay but um hopefully we can support you in some way Rob let us know um Bailey says she rescued another injured goose today please keep his parents in our thoughts and the other goslings who oh no lost it who have passed away um thanks for thanks for doing that Bailey um we've yesterday uh one of my housemates found a rat who had been poisoned and they ended up um, passing away. So um, it's, I think, kind of sad with, you know, fewer people out and just what's going on right now. I think a lot of the, the non-humans <laughs> who typically rely on us are kind of maybe being a little bit more forgotten. Um, Kathy says that I got muted. <laughs> Um, Kathy says they miss in-person activism. Me too. Nancy is feeling a little sad and sleepy, but glad to be here. Um, hey, them is also uh, hosting a rescued bunny. That's cool. 
and kitties sheltering in place with dogs. Lots of us, I'm sure, have some non-humans uh, keeping us company during the quarantine. And Cristiano and Yola, it sounds like they have some exciting news. Um, they received a letter from court saying that all charges are dropped after their civil disobedience action in Portugal. That's awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, it's great to, to see all of you here. And thanks again for, for joining. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. And for anyone who joined after I said this the first time, um, you know, tonight is going to be more of a workshop, not just a presentation. So if you need to take a minute right now to find a place where you can kind of settle in and just, um, you know, arrive and really be present, um, maybe so you can see the screen and turn on your video if that's available to you, um, that will be the best way for you to kind of experience this workshop. And if you haven't already done so, it's really helpful if you can rename yourself on Zoom so that your name is what you like to be called. And if you put your pronouns in there as well, um, that's really helpful. And if you wanna put where you're located, uh, it's kind of cool because sometimes people live in the same city and they don't even know it and they can meet on this call. So invitation to do that. And um, yeah, I know a lot of uh, folks on this call have been on many calls with us before. So just a quick reminder that, you know, we do uh, enforce our code of conduct online, even though it's an online event and we're not gathering in person. So if you are violating the code of conduct, um, you know, someone will just message you and then uh, you'll probably be removed if that behavior continues. And, um, you know, we do take extensive precautions to prevent things like that and prevent Zoom bombing, but just a warning that, you know, we're not in full control on these kinds of meetings. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, welcome. This is the Animal Liberation Online Assembly, and this workshop is called The Revolution Will Be Facilitated. Um, so I, a lot of us found the chat already, and we're going to use the chat a lot today. So if you haven't found it yet, this is a good opportunity to do that. And I want to hear from all of you just what brought you here today. Um, if there's a specific thing or just kind of what your impression is, what you're hoping to take away. Uh, from today. So just take a minute here and just, you know, let me know like what brought you here and, and uh, what you're hoping to kind of take away today. <laughs> Rasa says that she'd like to make discussions more interesting. Um, cool. Dan wants some new tips on how to facilitate meetings. Kathy says that <laughs> she wants to be part of the revolution. Yes. Well, you are. We all are just by being here. <laughs> um, cool. Anyone else, feel free to chime in in the chat and just let us know um, what brought you here today. Um, Dan Balsamo encouraged Camille to come to learn how to facilitate meetings. That's awesome. Um, the good title is what brought you here. <laughs> all right. Hopefully the content can live up to the title and Maya. Oh, all the way from New Zealand. Wow. I don't even know what time it must be over there, but, um, cool. Thanks for being here. And Maya says that she wants to be inspired, um, from all the activists around the world. <laughs> Cristiano and Yola heard there's food. Honestly, if we could get food like happening through these online trainings, I don't know if we would ever need to meet again in person. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, cool. This is awesome. So, oh, someone's first time here on the online assembly. That's really cool. Welcome. And, um, cool. People, you know, enjoy learning new things and, uh, interested in how it all works in case you have an opportunity in the future to use facilitation. Well, yeah, that's awesome. So we'll definitely get into some of this stuff today. And, um, I've got lots of time for questions and hopefully more like discussion where, you know, you all can be a part of the conversation because something, you know, one of the kind of main things to know about facilitation is it's an ongoing process. It's not something that you just, you know, you're anointed one day and now you're a facilitator. It's something that even really experienced facilitators are always learning new things. And it's something that you really learn a lot by doing. So, you know, you can kind of sit here and, and learn the things that I'm going to talk about today and um, you can go to other facilitation workshops, but the best training for this kind of thing is practice. And so um, this is something that I'm going to talk about. It doesn't need to just be used in like meetings or facilitating a workshop or something like that. You can use facilitation just in everyday conversations that you have um, with other people or conversations that other people have with each other. And so 
you know, the kind of purpose of today is to give you some ideas and some things to kind of like mull over. And hopefully, you know, the next time that you're in some of these conversations, you can think about these things and start to just integrate more of them into your practice. Um, cool. So throughout the presentation, if you want to leave any questions in the chat, um, you can feel free to do that at any time. I do have some breaks where I'll address questions and um, Dan's going to help me out by keeping track of them. So I know it's hard sometimes to keep track of your own questions. So feel free to just write them in the chat whenever they come up and I'll get to them um, in those little breaks. And I'll also share my contact info as well as some resources at the end of the presentation. So, um, you know, that will be at the end as well. So first I'll just, you know, introduce myself for people who don't know me. Uh, my name is Joanna Nicoletos. I am an activist, uh, you know, primarily in the animal rights movement and an organizer with Direct Action Everywhere. Right now I'm living just outside of Berkeley, California in a town called Albany, not Albany, New York, but Albany, California. And originally I'm from Canada. So, you know, organizing events um, is something that I've kind of done throughout a lot of my life. And since finding the animal rights movement, that was kind of where I found my place. I was like, oh, I, I know how to organize events and this is something I can do here. And um, so growing up, I was uh, in art school, which meant that we spent half the day doing like normal, you know, math and science kind of stuff. And the other half of the day we spent doing things like music and art, drama, mime, dance, all the kind of art, artsy stuff. And so that was very much a facilitated environment. It wasn't like an authoritarian one where someone was always telling us something. It was an environment where people, students were encouraged to kind of learn from each other and learn by, um, you know, being collaborative and being creative together. So like this picture here is kind of a frequent arrangement for how we would spend our day in, in class. We didn't really spend a lot of time at desks, especially compared to normal, you know, um, school kids. So I got very used to working collaboratively with, with groups of people. And when I went to college, I was really drawn towards activities that required collaboration and teamwork. So, you know, I would kind of be on like committees and councils and stuff. And I frequently facilitated meetings as part of my role in, in doing that. But I never, I didn't know that term facilitation. And so back then to me, it was this thing of, I was leading the meeting. Like I was going to either lead the conversation in a certain direction, or I was going to lead us through this like list of agenda items. Um, I tried to find a picture of myself like facilitating or like leading a meeting or something, but it turns out when you're doing that, no one wants to take your picture because um, it's not that cool <laughs> or not that cool looking. It's very cool to be the facilitator. So anyways, after college, I found the animal rights community and I, you know, started learning more about what it was to be in this community. And I attended ALC and um, ALC is the Animal Liberation Conference. Um, and I kind of learned that my background had a very applicable place in this community. And um, I was also, you know, really interested in just education. Both my parents are teachers. And so, um, joining the animal rights community, I also found Kingi and nonviolence. And I'm sure many folks on this call have been to nonviolence trainings. And when I was going through the process of becoming a nonviolence trainer, that was when I learned what facilitation was. So part of the training um, was how to facilitate a workshop. So then in this case, it was facilitating, you know, a medium sized group, but the Kingi and nonviolence trainings, what really kind of stands out about them is that they're they're interactive and you learn through the experience of the workshop. So it's not a lecture where someone's just telling you facts. It's a place where as the trainer or as the facilitator, you're kind of setting up this stage in an environment where people are going to have opportunities to learn about the topics that you're trying to teach them. And so since then, I've learned that facilitation is not just something you can do in a training environment but it's also something that can make even kind of the most like minor conversations lead to more effective outcomes. So like an example of this is I live in a house with um, five other humans and we, you know, we have regular house meetings and recently we decided we want to have facilitated meetings. So we're going to take turns facilitating the meetings and, you know, the facilitator is basically just going to keep us on track, make sure we get through all of the agenda items and just kind of hold the space um, for, for that meeting. Um, 
And so, you know, as a community that really believes in nonviolence, and I think, you know, most of us are in the animal rights community, and that is a really big part of our values. Um, one of the key things of nonviolence is it's about reconciliation, not resolution. And so reconciliation means healing from all sides, and it means getting a group to a place where they're moving forward together. So they're actually at a place where their relationships can heal people who were maybe on opposing sides before. And resolution is not what's going to lead you to that. Resolution is like maybe what people can kind of bear to live with, but it could still lead to resentment. And so reconciliation is kind of more of a place that promotes collaboration and community. And so that's, I think, for me, one of the other reasons why this is so important in this community, because we really believe in reconciliation, not just resolution. And so having a facilitator, um, we're going to make sure that we're really hearing as the facilitator all the different kind of needs that people are raising and hopefully come to this kind of reconciled um, end where people are actually able to you know, still have relationships with each other. So before we get more into some content, um, I want to play a short video here. Um, let's see, we've got to reload. Hey, I was on this date the other night and um, we were at this restaurant. Right. Okay, I'm just going to let it um, buffer up for like one second here. All right. Hey, I was on this date the other night, and um, we were at this restaurant. All right, guys, you guys ready to get started? Hang on a second. And Trip, you ready to get started, buddy? Okay. Hey, you guys, we're all here. We should start. All right. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. I just wanted to take a few minutes and talk about some ideas for the marketing strategy this year. So if you got one, just throw it out there. I'd love to hear. Yeah. Um, how long is this meeting supposed to last? The schedule wasn't exactly clear. Should be out of here in 30. Is that approximate or? Hey guys, sorry I'm a couple minutes late. I got caught in traffic. Seven minutes actually. What's that? A couple is two. Uh, so what we're doing is we're just coming up with some ideas for our new marketing strategy. Sure. So, anyone? I think we should implement Pinterest. Oh, that's a fun idea. What about a publicity event in the park? Interesting. But how are you going to plan around the weather? What if it rains? So we'll party in the rain. Okay, just want to emphasize there's no bad ideas here. We're just brainstorming. So. Yeah, I'm just really thinking it'll be a huge waste of money to try to plan around the weather. Yeah, okay, we get your concerns. Nancy, thank you. Okay, um, anyone else have an idea? Ephraim. I've always wanted to see rain fall down all at once in a big splash instead of small drops over time. I mean, think how it could impact the irrigation system. Okay. Uh, Terry? Well, um, I have an idea from my previous job that I had last year. But, um, let me take that back a little bit. I have this wonderful idea, but it doesn't really make sense unless I just take it back a second and bring it forward together. It was like three weeks ago that I remember oh. he said whoa, something whoa, whoa, whoa. that I couldn't understand. Hold on a second, Terry. Hold on. Thanks for pointing. Here's what we need to do, okay? Uh, Lauren, you got this? We do a video submission contest on YouTube. Oh, okay? that's been done. It'll be on Facebook, it'll be on Pinterest, it'll be on Twitter. If we do something with technology, we lose the senior demographic. So, uh, you guys want to see an example? Should we be moving on to the next topic? I mean, uh, it's already quarter after. <laughs> quarter after, that's funny. Uh, who knows how to put this on the screen? Up there, because you're not going to be able to, I want you to see all the details. We have cables, this cable work? And that's a and it's power. Uh, I don't know if on the TV, there's an yeah, HDMI one. port. That cord's not going to be long enough. In the back, Does that remote go to like the two or three, TV? Like HDMI one. Plenty of time, guys. Two, no rush. HDMI this isn't three, working. I got a green marker. Call the IT guy. With, uh, Wait, there's turn also, the off oh, and back on? what do you call the S-video? Hello? Okay, I've got it. All right, so that's enough of that. Um, <laughs> so aside from the lack of racial and gender diversity in the video. Um, I would love to hear from people, just some of the things you, you noticed, um, you know, about like the meeting and kind of the facilitation. I think for some of us who've been in a lot of meetings um, or who have a lot of experience in meetings, this is, you know, this is kind of funny to me because um, it's kind of this like really uh, stylized example of like all the things that go wrong in meetings. And so this is just kind of like an example, um, an example of, 
kind of why we need facilitation. And obviously this is a very extreme example, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, what you can imagine. And at the end of this presentation, maybe when we think back to this video, you can kind of imagine like what a good facilitator could really do in that meeting and how much of a difference that could make. Um, someone was asking for the link to that. So I'll just put it in the chat right now. Um, people were all over the place. Everyone talked past each other. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, people were not even talking about the same thing or like they weren't staying on, on topic about what it was they were, they were talking about. And, you know, the facilitator kind of person was saying it's a brainstorm, but then like, instead of just shooting out ideas, people would like nitpick at these ideas and, and say why they were bad. But it's like, that's not what you do in a brainstorm. We just want to get all the ideas out first. Um, so it was all over the place. Um, um, I think that's Nancy saying didn't get a feel for where people were at. So um, yeah, like maybe not understanding people's positions. Um, definitely met a few ramblers. No clear agenda or procedure set for communication. That's a great point. Yeah, there was no way to indicate like who's supposed to be speaking. Um, cool. So it sounds like, you know, y'all are already kind of on, on a good a good starting ground here. We can already identify some of the problems. So, so this is really good. So, you know, we, we revert to what we know as much as we really want to, um, you know, think that we're just going to be able to like read something and just implement it or, you know, that we're these like really revolutionary, um, innovative, you know, beings, we are also like creatures of habit. And so it's really easy for us to revert to what we know. And we're products of our socialization. So when something's familiar, because it's kind of what we've seen all around us, that's what's comfortable. And it's really easy for us to just kind of fall into that. So there's kind of two models that we usually use to see or understand power and decision making, um, like how they kind of exist. So the first one is command and control. And basically, this looks like um, authority and direction coming from a specifically designated individual. So this is kind of like how a lot of corporations are structured, military, it's kind of like one place or one office, like, you know, going down the chain of command and like telling people what, what the different things they need to do are. And we um, do this, we choose this model because we've been conditioned to understand or to believe that efficiency and collaboration don't go together. So this kind of hierarchical structure is just going to be more efficient. And we don't use our collaboration muscles, so we don't even know how to collaborate. We can't even imagine what that would look like. And we also don't have models to follow in terms of what works for collaboration. So we don't even know how, how to collaborate with each other. And then we also all have this internalized powerlessness from growing up as children in this society. So we give up on ourselves, we give up on others, on the possibility of togetherness. Um, so that, those are kind of some of the reasons why command and control is comfortable for us and why it's something that you know a lot of us just end up reverting to even without realizing because it's all around us. This is like the primary way that decisions are made and that power is kind of um, handed out. So then there's consensus and we usually choose consensus because we want to include every voice. And we also want to avoid the, the downsides of you know, having these power differences, of having this kind of more hierarchical structure. And we do it because we really do believe in collective wisdom. Um, but the only way we really understand how to tap into that collective wisdom is through consensus. But even a system like using consensus is not going to lead to an integrative outcome because when we use consensus, um, it kind of creates pressure to agree. And so that's why maybe some of us have had this experience where, you know, we're facilitating in this kind of grassroots environment or we're organizing and we thought there was like this meeting where um, you know a bunch of people were participating and we have this consensus based decision making process and so we come to a decision together and we're like okay great we're gonna like do this project together and everyone is bought in because we got here by consensus and maybe it's a couple weeks maybe it's months later um, somewhere down the line it feels like wait people like they're not bought in the way that I thought they were it 
feels like I'm their boss. You know, it feels like this hierarchy is now happening, but how is that happening if we had this consensus thing where we thought everyone was bought in? And, you know, one of the reasons that that happens is because this consensus based um, process doesn't really leave space for people to like um, stay true to their feelings. It kind of creates that pressure to agree with, with the group. Um, and one of the resources I'm going to include at the end is a webinar by Mickey Cashtan, and she has a whole um, system called Convergent Facilitation, and it's, you know, longer than um, we could go through on this training, but some of these, this specific, uh, you know, these models and stuff is kind of uh, borrowed from, from what she teaches. So what she teaches is an integrative approach. So we're looking to include every need in the decision making and not every voice needs to be included. So we're kind of taking um, the perspective of a needs-based approach to understanding human nature. And this is really uh, um, compatible with nonviolence because um, one of the kind of things in nonviolence and um, you know, if you've learned at all about nonviolent communication, there's a really strong focus on needs. And so um, that's kind of one of the, the key things to this integrative approach is if we try to include everyone's voice, that's just so many voices to include. And as the group grows in size, it's harder to accommodate for that number of voices. But the needs, no, at a certain point, once you start to expand the group, even if you add more people, there's going to be a finite number of needs in any given group with any given decision. And so if you're talking about the needs, there actually might be a way to include all of those needs in your decision, but you may not be able to include every single voice. So as the facilitator here, we want to try to get to that needs, um, you know, kind of foundation behind people's positions so that we can actually understand what it is that we're talking about and what, where we need to kind of brainstorm in terms of coming up with solutions. Um, and consensus-based decision-making feels right a lot of the time because we think that there's a need to include every voice. So, you know, this is kind of a way to reconcile that. We want to include everyone, so we include everyone's needs, and that actually allows us to um, have space to include all of those things. So other things about the integrative approach, um, we, there's an agreement on the principles rather than positions, so we can always come back to um, shared principles or, you know, values. Um, people were talking about a willingness rather than a preference. So, you know, something that I think maybe people in, in the grassroots space will um, identify with is, you know, when you're organizing in a grassroots way, you really are depending on people's willingness to work on something. If they don't want, to, there's, you know, there's not like a job where there's, you know, incentive to do things because you're, you'll get fired if you don't. Um, in grassroots, it's really based on people's willingness to work on something. So we're talking about willingness rather than preference, um, because you may have a preference for one thing or the other, but does that change your willingness to, you know, be involved in the project or to put time into the project? And we're also wanting to shift from an either or mindset. So sometimes we have this kind of binary thinking where it's like, okay, well, either it's what you want or what I want. And there's like no way to think of something that could get us both what we want. So we're looking instead for solutions that work for everyone instead of either or thinking. Um, all right, cool. No questions in the chat so far. Um, and one thing that uh, Mickey has talked about here is because of the way that we are raised in our society, and, and if you wanna learn more about this, I would recommend watching the webinar that I will um, share with everyone after. But she talks about how the way that we grow up causes us to, as adults, um, constantly monitor, monitor what's around us to see if it's okay with other, if what we're doing is okay with other people. So we're not inner oriented to understand our own needs and ability to discern which consequence for my actions am I willing to accept or not? Instead, we're thinking, we're thinking about other people's needs and thinking like, if I do this, is it going to, like, what is someone else's reaction going to be? Um, and we're oriented towards fear instead of our values. So because of this, we need to, 
as the facilitators, be aware that we need to keep an eye on the needs and try to get to that needs based thing that people are expressing because many people aren't in tune with that for that, um, aren't in tune with that for themselves. So by getting to the needs of each person, we can do something to address the fact that generally we aren't in touch with our own needs. And so the facilitator can try to guide people towards trying to recognize that for themselves. Um, hopefully that makes sense. If there are questions, um, definitely throw them in the chat. Um, yeah. Couldn't the attributes so, you outline here for the integrative approach apply to either of the models that you mentioned? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, both and. Okay, be thing. So Sam's question. Um, I would. I wouldn't say that these things could be applied to the to the other um, command and control or consensus based decision making because um, you know a lot of like. So for example, um, with command and control, like someone's preference could totally be a factor in, in decision-making because if they just have more power in the hierarchy, then their preference is more important than someone else's willingness. So this is a lot more of a collaborative, like um, egalitarian approach um, where, at, and you know, maybe that could be applied to consensus, but with consensus, you're not really, um, it's, I don't know if people have experience, um, you know, working in consensus-based decision-making kind of uh, in that space, but it does really create pressure to agree because once, a, like, depending on your, your structure, sometimes it's everyone has to agree on something or sometimes it's just the majority of the group has to agree. But if it's everyone has to agree, and where I used to use um, consensus decision-making, we had it so that basically everyone had to agree to be able to kind of live with the outcome. So it doesn't have to be your preference, but as long as everyone can live with it, that counts as like, we can go ahead, the group's okay with it. And once there's a, a majority, so if like, you know, whatever, four, like even if four out of eight people are like, oh yeah, I want to do that thing, it automatically creates this pressure where you're like, oh, now I'm the one opinion standing in the way of like what all these people think. And so it turns into them trying to convince you of their position rather than them trying to listen to your objections and hear the needs behind it and try to adapt what is happening um, so that it can also meet, meet their needs. Um, Rasa asks, how would you encourage people to voice their needs? Um, that's, a really, <laughs> that's a really good question and honestly could probably have a whole like workshop on its own. I will talk a little bit more about this. Um, I think nonviolent communication is a really useful thing for anyone who's interested in like, I mean, just anyone in general to learn more about, but especially if you're interested in facilitation, I think that um, nonviolent communication, the more that you kind of learn about it, you're able to um, use language and ask questions in a way that are um, trying to get, to get to the basis of those needs. So as the facilitator, to answer your question, Rasa, I would say um, to encourage people to voice their needs, you should ask questions as the facilitator and try to like clarify their position and just kind of like go get, you know, deeper to like, okay, um, maybe, you know, we're going to have some like role plays later, um, some little skits. So maybe we can kind of come back to that question too and with some more examples. Um, all right. So what is facilitation? Um, maybe some people could, could chime in in the chat what, what you think it is. We've kind of talked a little bit about this already. guiding the meeting. Sure, yeah, guiding is definitely um, a good word to use. You're not um, kind of like forcing people in a certain direction, but you want to, you know, be the person who kind of has an eye on the compass and make sure you're going in the direction that you want. Um, so really like the definition, I, I did Google it, of, you know, facilitate is to make a process um, or an action easy or easier. And it's also kind of like this artful way to move a group through conversations and successfully achieve some kind of goal. Um, I, I like to think of it as being the referee so that other people can participate. Like it's kind of hard if you're the one keeping score to also be like really engaged in playing the game because you're like, oh, I, I got to remember the score. I can't forget the score. So you can kind of be that person to keep track of everything and other people can just kind of let their minds um, flow. 
And as the facilitator, you're also going to hold the group accountable to agreements and constraints. So these could be things like time limits, whether it's like a speaking time limit or the time limit of the meeting or that specific topic, like, okay, we're going to spend 15 minutes on this one topic and you're going to enforce that time. And, you know, you can also hold the group accountable to other agreements like group norms, you know, respect for each other, not interrupting. Um, if there's a way that you have agreed to indicate that you want to be the next speaker, like raising your hand or putting a star in the chat or something like that. And facilitation, like I said, is not just for trainings or meetings, but it can also be for conversations, house meetings. Um, you know, there, there's kind of an endless way that these things can be applied and it's not like it's going to be applied in the same way every at every single one of those things so you know you're probably not going to facilitate a house meeting the way that you would facilitate like a board meeting or something like that you know but some of these little tricks um, and the and the mindset and the skills behind them can be useful in in many different settings um Oh, Amanda has a really good point. Yeah, as an interpreter, I say that I facilitate communication. So I'm able to connect two people in order to communicate. Not sure if that totally applies, but it makes com communication smoother. I think that totally applies. That's a really good example. Um, and yeah, facilitation is not just like the person who makes the agenda and kind of guides this meeting. Like there's so many ways that you can, you know, facilitate different things. You could like facilitate um, a trade if like I know someone who, you know, needs a hair dryer, and I know someone else who like has a hair dryer and needs a plant. I could like facilitate an introduction between those two people, and and um, yeah. So it is kind of goes back to that first one, the first point on there, which is like making an action or a process easier, easier. So you know, Amanda's example, you're making it easy or even possible for someone to participate or understand. So good facilitators keep an eye on the goals. They make sure that everyone in the group feels heard. They help people to identify those needs that we talked about. And they're guiding people to a collaborative space. So instead of being in a space where it's competitive or combative and we're kind of defending our own ideas, they want to guide people to a place that is more collaborative. Um, cool. So this is kind of what good facilitators do. Um, and now we'll talk about what you actually do to facilitate. But first, let's just imagine a scenario. Um, you know, we're a bunch of community organizers in a chapter together, and we're talking about what our protest next month should look like. So the first person who speaks is called the anchoring idea. And then the next person who speaks, their idea kind of becomes the polarity. So now people are thinking in terms of this is the spectrum of where ideas can exist. And these two ideas are now framing the rest of the conversation. And 70% of the time, the anchoring idea is the one that's chosen, not because it's always the better one, but just because it's what people said first or what was said first. And that's what's framing people's understanding of the conversation. And so by having a meeting where this is the structure, you're really limiting the idea space because what could have been, you know, this whole slide of where ideas can exist, these two things were said before people even had an opportunity to form their own ideas. And so now that's kind of, um, it's like uh, clouding their vision. Does that make sense? Cool. So, Instead, if we ask people to take three minutes and silently write down their ideas, you know, their ideas are going to occupy a lot more of the idea space because they're not being limited by that anchoring view. So if we say like, okay, what should our protest next month look like? And someone says, the first person says, well, the signs should say it's not food, it's violence. Now everyone's thinking about signs. And so it's kind of like, okay, now let's talk about what the signs should say. But the question was, what should our protest look like? Maybe someone else's idea didn't involve signs at all. But now that that idea has been said, that's kind of keeping people, it's like framing the whole conversation. So by first giving people time to individually reflect um, and just think of their own ideas, you're going to get a, a kind of wider idea space. And that first anchoring thought isn't going to be influencing 
where people's ideas can exist. So there's a facilitator kind of um, trick called think, pair, share. And so the first part is think. So that's where you do the independent reflection and you take a couple minutes and people can write things down or just think to themselves. Um, and then you have people pair up um, and then they can share their ideas with each other. And sometimes that helps because if you have a large group, not everyone is going to have an opportunity to actually speak. So it can be helpful to, you know, people can speak to their partner. And then if they're comfortable speaking in front of a large group, they can. But it's also not going to um, make it so that there are some people in the group never who never have an opportunity to speak at all. At least they've been heard by one person. So pair is really good. And sometimes hearing someone else's ideas will stimulate new ideas for yourself um, or talking something through with someone will ma make you have an even better idea. And then share is where you come back to the whole group. And so then, you know, people can share. And by doing this, um, we're basically like when you come back to the group for, for share, you know, someone's still going to have to speak first, but everyone else's ideas aren't going to be limited by that thought that somebody shared because people have already taken up all of this idea space. And so that first person who speaks isn't going to have as much ability to influence people because everyone already has their own ideas formed at this point. So that's kind of one move um, that facilitators can, can keep in their toolkit. I really like this one. And if you don't want to do pair, if it's, you know, a, a meeting of like 10 people or something, you could just do think share. So you just take some time to reflect on your own and then you come back and, and you know, share with the group. And this is also a good example of like what facilitation is. So it's being aware of how conversations can be impacted by flaws in our conditioning or emotional norms that we learn or through our education or whatever it is, and then intervening to try to result in better outcomes. So before we move on, let's just take a few minutes to write in the chat, um, some, or you can write, you know, if you don't want to share it in the chat, you can just write on a piece of paper or um, on a note on your computer or something. Um, so just write down like issues that you've had in group conversations or group decisions, like specific examples. You don't have to share like, you know, here's what we were deciding or names of people or anything like that, but just share some issues you've run into in group conversations that you would like to find a solution to with some facilitation tricks. So Cristiano and Yola are saying when no one gives feedback. Um, yeah, so kind of that awkward silence of just, um, you know, nobody really feeling bought in. Um, a couple people are saying, uh, oh, so Beth says some people dominate the meeting. Um, Kitty, people interrupting each other and bringing up a completely unrelated idea. Andy says when people get off track. Um, helping people to stop talking over those they disagree with. Yeah, so like that interrupting. Bailey, sometimes I'm scared to share my opinion or questions out of fear of judgment. Um, yeah, that's very, you know, that's very common. And if you're feeling that, there's probably other people in the group who are. So that's a really good example of something that as a facilitator, we part of our job is to make space for people who are maybe more shy or feel you know like they could be judged or something um, for their questions and really just keeping an eye on kind of the vibe of the group and seeing like okay has that person not spoken at all um, sometimes people need a little bit more space or a personal invitation to kind of join the conversation um, people not agreeing what the goal of the meeting is yeah um, Rasa, if someone has a very strong minority opinion on a decision, um, just spend more time discussing. Negative Nancy's, yeah, this is awesome. So it sounds like a lot of people have, um, have some experience in, in meetings, whether it's like facilitating or just being in the meeting. So that's really good because hopefully as we go through this, you can kind of think back to these examples that you shared and think of like, okay, which, which of these things could have helped that thing that, I, that I'm talking about? So facilitation 101, here's like kind of the main, you know, some main tips that I would say are like intro level facilitator stuff. So 
you want to do your homework. You know, you want to understand the issues that you're talking about. And if possible, especially if it's going to be a meeting where you know that there's like, we're having this meeting because there's like this big disagreement in the community or there's these two sides to something. It's useful if in advance you can maybe like talk to a couple people on both sides just to understand where like what the perspectives are and like what exactly it is that we're talking about here. And for a lot of us doing the homework is kind of like implicit in the work we do because we're not like professional facilitators who are hired to go into a company where we don't know anyone. It's like these, this is our own community. And so we know the different personalities. We know who speaks more than others and who's normally more shy. We know, you know, kind of the culture um, and stuff like that. But homework could also include things like research. So let's say we're going to have a discussion on like, should we allow alcohol at our events or something like that? Maybe as a facilitator, you want to come a little bit prepared and, um, do some research on like the alcohol laws in that area, just so you know, if that comes up in the conversation, you're prepared to kind of like fact check people. So you don't have to know all the facts. You know, we all have like, maybe not all of us, but a lot of us have access to like internet in some way when we're in these meetings. And so, you know, you can always check facts, but it is useful if there's some specific like facts or, um, you know, in, in community organizing, this could be like bylaws. Like if you're having a conversation about, um, should we be, you know, should this group be allowed to like do a protest or should they be allowed to like put this on their signs? Maybe there's some kind of bylaw or value that is, has to be a part of that conversation as well. And so that's part of doing your homework. And sometimes no matter how well you do your homework or how much you prepare, it's Murphy's law that something is going to come up that you're not equipped to handle and that's okay. But doing your homework can kind of like mitigate some of these things and just leave you in a position where you're more prepared to deal with, you know, situations. And we'll talk more later about what to do if, if something kind of goes wrong like that. Um, so you want to understand the goals and someone um, said this in the chat, like this was one of the issues is no one's in agreement about the goals. And this could be something that you do as homework. So if there's, if you're facilitating a meeting where um, it's already clear, like what the goals are going to be ahead of time, um, you could do that in advance, or you could do this at the start of the meeting and get everybody who's in the room on the same page about what the goals are. Um, so meeting goals could be just like, we're going to have a discussion on such and such thing, or it could be like, make a decision about if we should allow alcohol at events. But we just want to all know what the purpose of the conversation is and everyone in the meeting should be aware of what the goals are. And as the facilitator, you're trying to guide people to those goals. So if you don't know what the goals are, that's going to be really hard to do. And sometimes just by trying to get to this, just by doing this, like just by understanding what are the goals of the meeting, you might actually uncover some of the issues because like, nobody agrees on the goals. So, okay, let's have a conversation about what our goals are. And that could be like the first step. So as a facilitator, you want to create the container. So, you know, if you think of a container, like a nice little Tupperware, um, that's where the conversation is going to live within. So you want to set some boundaries, including if it's a decision-making conversation, you want to make sure everyone's clear about how the decision is being made. Is it a vote? or do certain people's voices matter more than others? Like what is the, what is the decision-making process? And then also things like group norms, you know, respect for each other, one speaker at a time. Um, is there a speaking time? So like people can only speak for 60 seconds or 90 seconds or something like that. And so as the facilitator, your job is to keep people in check and make sure that these boundaries are being respected. And so it's important at the beginning of a meeting to set those up so that you can refer back to them. Like, hey, remember how we decided we're not gonna speak over each other? Like, I need you to raise your hand. Um, and if the group is well-established or if it's a regular meeting, like if you're having weekly meetings, you don't necessarily need to do this at the beginning of every single meeting is like go through all the group agreements. But eventually like this, these things will kind of take hold of the group. So it's just kind of becomes the norm, but until it's a group norm, you might want to just like restate some of these things at the beginning, beginning of a meeting. And sometimes if you know, like, all right, this one person on my team, they always speak over other people. Maybe that's one of the group norms that you just bring into every meeting at the beginning. You're like, all right, remember, like, you know, we're going to have this meeting and we're talking about this thing. And just remember that we 
want to respect each other and to speak, we raise our hand and we're going to just ask that nobody speaks over other people and nobody interrupts. So maybe you have to say that every single time. And so as the facilitator, you know, you have to be kind of perceptive. And if these things keep coming up, you can do different types of interventions to try to um, mitigate those in the future. Um, and so, you know, then you're just going to, you're going to guide, like someone said in the chat, you're kind of holding the space for the group. So you want to hold space for people to form opinions. And sometimes um, people need time to think about things before they're able to share, like people need time to actually form their opinions. So sometimes it's good to literally leave space, hold like space in the conversation and invite people who haven't spoken yet take a few seconds to reflect and, you know, maybe one of those people can, um, can jump in. Um, and you want to keep the conversation oriented towards the goals or the topic at hand. So that's kind of where the guiding comes into play, holding space by keeping people accountable to the boundaries that we, that we've set. And, um, you also want to make sure there's a balance of voices and perspectives. So like I was saying, if someone you notice isn't speaking a lot, it's okay to call on them, but not single them out and be like, hey, Michael, um, you haven't said anything yet. Like, do you have any feelings on this? Because that's kind of like if, he, if Michael's like not paying attention or, or maybe doesn't know how he feels or maybe feels like his opinion might be controversial to the group, that's like a really awkward position to put someone in, especially if they're already maybe a bit more shy and not sharing their opinion. But you could give people a prompt. Like it could be, hey, you know, um, Dan just, just, just shared that, um, you know, he's not a fan of having alcohol at events because, um, you know, whatever reason, uh, do you agree with that, Michael? Like, how do you feel about that? So you can kind of give people a little prompt like that to invite them into the conversation in a way that's more accessible rather than this big abstract, like, how do you feel about this issue? Um, and then you also want to make sure, so balance of voices, make sure that people who aren't speaking are have an opportunity to be heard and people who are speaking a lot, maybe we just kind of keep them in check and, and have them step back a little bit. And then you also want to balance the perspectives. So if everyone who's speaking is speaking for the same idea or they're all having the same perspective and there's people in the group who aren't speaking, maybe instead of calling on the next person in the speaker order, you just say, okay, we've heard a lot of people speak like for having alcohol at events. Um, is there anyone who wants to speak against it? And so that's like an invitation to someone who maybe right now is feeling like, ooh, everyone is saying we should have alcohol and I'm really against it, but everyone's saying it. So like, maybe we just should. And now they're like, oh, okay, I'm being invited into the conversation to share like why I think we shouldn't. So that personal invitation is really good for, um, you know, kind of making sure there's that balance there. And then you also want to help clarify the needs. So, you know, this, we're not going to be able to get fully into every single thing today. And this is something that really, um, I would recommend learning more about nonviolent communication to really like get, get good at this. Um, but it's helpful to repeat back what people are saying. So if someone shares their perspective, you can just kind of repeat back like a summarized version to understand, to make sure you understand their position. And if you are familiar with you know needs and 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 nonviolent communication, um, you can try to reflect some of the needs that they're having. So this isn't going to be a nonviolent communication workshop, but if you are familiar with NVC, um, this is a really good uh, way to apply that. So some other kind of pointers to um, keep in mind as a facilitator. Actually, before we do that, let me just uh, check the chat here. Um, Okay. Someone, when they shared, was chastised for their views. So that sounds like there was either no facilitator or not a very good facilitator. Um, because the facilitator, your job is to make sure that people, that it's safe for people to share their views. And so it's not that you can prevent someone from being like, you know, oh, that's stupid or something like that. But you can check that person and be like, hey, we agreed to be respectful with, with each other here. And, you know, if you're going to continue to use language like that and disrespect other members of the group, then I'm going to ask you not to be part of this conversation or something like that. Um, Kitty hates it when people say, what do you think, Kitty? Yeah, it usually happens right in that moment where you stop paying attention to the meeting. And then it's like in school, you know, the teacher like calls on you. <laughs> so it's really good if you can give people something where it's like, even if they weren't paying attention, um, 
you know, they're, they're being invited with like this specific question, they could even just answer like yes or no to. Um, there will be a recording of this workshop. It will be emailed out with all of the recordings of ALOA next week. So um, that will be fine. Uh, we'll share that with you. And um, how do you gently let someone know they're rambling off topic? Um, so that kind of goes to the guiding the conversation to the goal. So it's like, okay, the goal of this meeting, so, you know, let's say Dan has a rambly answer about why we shouldn't have alcohol at events. Sorry to keep picking on you, Dan, but I know you, you won't hate me for it. <laughs> um, so Dan has this really rambly answer. And, you know, at the end he was talking about, um, you know, having no palm oil, like in the foods that we serve at our events. And um, so, you know, after Dan is, is done speaking or, or maybe even if he's still speaking and it's kind of this rambling thing that's going on, um, I could just say, Hey, yeah, thanks for that. That sounds like a really important topic. Like, should we have palm oil in our, in our, um, in the food at our events? And maybe we could have that conversation at a different time because right now this conversation is about, should we have alcohol at our events? So let's, let's focus on that right now. And, you know, if you want to, uh, if you want to have a, a separate discussion later about, um, palm oil, maybe, you know, you could organize that and let people know or something like that. Um, okay, so some other pointers, um, you know, own the room. It's, you know, obviously it's a collective space. So you're not the main like star of the, of the show, but you're the one leading it. You're helping to create it. And so you should own that leadership role and um, make sure you're also using a strong um, like voice. So you're, you know, being direct and, and firm and you're kind of projecting properly. Um, play dumb. So if, people are using obscure examples or language that maybe you don't even understand or things that you're just like, that's really big language or, or saying concepts. Like if we were having a meeting and I just kept saying right to rescue and it's like, not everybody knows what that is. So as the facilitator, it's good if you can kind of play dumb because there's probably people in the group who don't understand and they're maybe too shy to say it. So if you can just say like, could you just clarify that a little bit? Or can you explain what that means? Um, it's, it's you know not going to put someone in that awkward position where they feel like they can no longer be part of the conversation because it's just over their head. Um, so you want to feel the room, you know, take breaks when you need to. Um, be aware of people's like vibe, and if something suddenly changes or someone seems to be maybe like triggered by something, um, this is something that you'll want to you know to follow up on and just be aware of. It's hard for this one to give specific things like oh just do this because. This one is really kind of just about being perceptive and, and your sort of energy. Um, so, you know, we kind of talked about this one on the last slide, good facilitators. Um, it's good to encourage participation. So leaving that space for people to jump in sometimes like 30 seconds of silence is what somebody needs to like gather their own thoughts. Some people have a hard time thinking while they're listening to other people speak. So it's good if you just leave some space in between speakers to give people time for that. Um, and, oh, oh no. Oh yeah. Okay. And then, um, vary ways for people to participate as well. So, you know, this could be a whole workshop as well, but not everyone can track abstract conversations just based on what's being said. For some people, it's helpful to have like notes. So maybe you have a note taker for the meeting and people can follow along on the document. Um, for some people, like things like flip charts or sticky notes are good. So there's all kinds of ways that you can, uh, can do this. Um, and if we have time at the end, I'll show one specific example that, is, that you can do over Zoom as well. Um, so hopefully we have time for that. I'm um, going to just check the chat again here. What would you do in a workshop with a whiteboard when someone just takes control of the whiteboard and pens and basically takes over the meeting? Um, so, I mean, okay, so it's a bit hard for me to imagine like what, how exactly that would look, but just the way I'm thinking about it. So maybe you give the markers to someone because it's like they're going to draw something to illustrate their example. And then suddenly now they just like take over the meeting. This is where it goes back to that first point here about owning the room. As the facilitator, you need to just be confident enough to step in. And if someone is just going on and on and they're taking over, I actually have a really hard time doing this and it's something I need to work on as a facilitator is like, you just need to step in and I'll talk about this more later, but sometimes the facilitator just needs to kind of be the bad guy. And that's part of your job as the facilitator. 
So if someone does that, um, you definitely need to just step in and say, Hey, yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, you know, we're going to, I'm going to ask you to sit down because we need to have time for everyone to speak. Um, but you know, if you want to talk more about that, maybe you can stick around after or something like that. Um, and think, you know, as you get more experience, you'll find ways to kind of let people down without like making it really harsh. So it's like, you know, Hey, great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, I'm going to ask you to take a seat now just so we can have space for other people. Don't make it about them. Like nobody wants to hear your thing, sit down, but like, yeah, we're just going to leave space for other people. And you know, you can talk about this more at the end, or maybe next time we can have this conversation, um, just to kind of not make it like, shut up. Um, what makes a good facilitator voice? Projection. So making sure you're loud enough that everyone can hear you. Enunciating your words. Like if people can't understand what you're saying, um, it's going to be hard for them to be engaged by what you're saying. And just general like kind of presence. So whether you like talk with your hands, just being confident when you speak, it's, it's kind of public speaking um, skills. So facilitation is a balancing act and we're balancing here care for the community. So this means that every person feels safe and empowered to participate um, on terms of equality. So ways that you can do this are having personal introductions, um, name tags, having people share their pronouns, um, enforcing boundaries when people's responses are personal or when a conversation is getting heated, making people feel that their ideas are valuable or important, and just general caring for people in the group. Like if you're noticing someone's feeling upset, finding an appropriate way. Maybe you take a short break and, and talk to that person um, individually and see what's up. Um, things like check-ins at the beginning of a meeting or at the beginning of a call, like we did here, is also a really good way to kind of just understand, like, what are people bringing into the meeting? You, you know, we want to care about people's emotional state and just their general well-being in that moment. Um, and so this is, so yeah, care for the community. This is where we want to you know, stick up for the people in the meeting, make sure if someone is being attacked or being chastised for the thing that they said, we're going to step in and make sure that that person knows we care about them and we're not going to let them be chastised in, in this group. And that's not something that's acceptable in this group as a norm. So we have to balance care for the community and then also care for the inquiry. So the inquiry being the topic or the goal of the meeting. So you have to balance those two things because we can't just spend the whole meeting talking about everyone's like feelings and what's going on in their life because we came here to talk about a goal. But sometimes those things, the feelings and the emotions might get in the way of us talking about the goal. So we have to like balance these two things. And so care for the inquiry means we're addressing the topic at hand and not deviating. So we're not going to deviate too much into, you know, talking about someone's like childhood experience that makes them think that alcohol is really bad. And now we're talking about this person's like childhood, but we want to find a way to still express care for what that person is sharing and for the emotions that they're feeling. Um, and so with care for the inquiry, we want to keep the group on topic, like make sure we're talking about the subject we agreed to talk about and also encourage divergent thinking. So not divergent in the sense of like, we're having this meeting about, you know, alcohol and you're going to talk about palm oil but in the sense of let's think outside the box. Let's not limit ourselves to these two like anchoring points. We want to expand the idea space. And so you want to encourage people who have different perspectives. If everyone is sharing the same perspective, let's encourage like, Hey, does anyone have a different perspective? I want to hear from you. Um, and another resource I'll share at the end is um, my friend, Aaron Yarmel's. Uh, he has a dialogue facilitation course that you can sign up for. It's like over, I believe a number of weeks. And this is one of the things he talks about, which is care for the community and care for the inquiry. And he has more kind of tips on how you can balance these things and specific like moves that you can use for either. And another thing that we need to balance is care for ourselves as the facilitator. So like I said, sometimes as the facilitator, we have to be the bad guy or interject, you know, keeping people in check. Sometimes it's intimidating or awkward. And as the facilitator, you kind of have to accept that that's your role but it's also really draining to be in that role, especially for you know, specific people, it's really draining, but in general for anyone, like this is just something that is, it affects you. So as the facilitator, you should make sure you take time after meetings to decompress and just be aware of the fact that you and your vibe is gonna affect the group. So if you're overscheduled and you're like rushing between meetings and you're coming into this meeting all frazzled and now you're trying to facilitate, that's gonna affect you know, how the group is going to function. 
And if you're bringing, if you're like really upset because something happened yesterday and you're like still not over it and you're like really angry and you're just bringing that into the meeting, or if you're like pissed off at someone in the group because they did something, um, that's also going to affect the vibe. So make sure you're really taking care of yourself. Um, can facilitators contribute to the conversation? How do they make sure they don't act accidentally abuse their power and talk too much? Um, that's a really good question. And so it's kind of hard because I think, and the way that a lot of like pr professional, like this is basically what a lot of consultants do in like a more corporate setting is you have an outside person come in and facilitate because they're objective and they don't have a stake or an opinion in the conversation that's going on. And so they can, you know, it's perceived that they're more fair and they're going to balance all these different perspectives. Um, and it, and maybe they actually are, but the perception thing is huge too. Um, so I think in an ideal situation, it's best if the facilitator kind of stands a little bit on the sidelines and doesn't really participate in the conversation. Um, one reason, because it is easy, obviously, to kind of abuse that and end up talking too much because you're already facilitating the call um, or the conversation. But the other reason is the perception that people in the group will have. So if I'm, I, if I'm in this group and we're having a conversation about should we have alcohol at events and Dan's facilitating, and then Dan's also sharing this like super strong opinion that we shouldn't and like sharing all these stories from like childhood and just like really strong in this opinion, I'm going to be like, wait, Dan is like facilitating the conversation, but he like really cares about this issue. So how can I trust that he's going to guide us in the, in the direction of what the group wants and not just like of his own opinion. So having the trust of the group as the facilitator is really important. And if you are doing something that the group perceives to be like a violation of that trust or like abusing your kind of facilitator power, that's really going to affect your ability to facilitate the group um, in a productive way. So it is best if you can not uh, really infuse your opinion. Like if, you know, but then also like that's kind of hard because especially like in the setting that a lot of us are kind of working in, we have to facilitate the meetings for the teams that we're on and we're on the team. So we obviously care about the outcome of things. Um, and so it's okay to have an opinion about something. And it's good to just be open about that, but not to like become overbearing with your opinion. So if we're talking about this thing and um, Dan is facilitating the alcohol conversation and he's like, you know, just to, okay, so everyone's talking about, no, we shouldn't have alcohol at events. And then Dan is like, all right, that's great. You know, um, I'm going to ask for someone to speak who thinks that we should have alcohol at events. But before that, I just want to also say that I feel we shouldn't. And so, you know, that's my opinion and it, it matters as, as much as anyone else's opinion here, but I just want you all to know that. And I also wanted to share it with you so that you can be aware that that's my like bias in the conversation. So just sharing a little bit like that can actually make people trust you more because they're like, oh, you're aware of your bias. So now we can kind of, we all know all the different things. There's nothing sneaky going on behind closed doors. Um, but it's definitely good to keep yourself in check too. And, you know, you're enforcing those group norms with everyone about, time limits and all that kind of stuff, but you also have to enforce it for yourself. Um, okay, and so this is one last thing um, from Mickey Cashtan about kind of the conditions for collaboration. I'm just gonna run through these quickly because I, I wanna make sure we get to this next activity. Um, so these are, the, these are what she says, like if these things are met or like the more we have of all these things, the easier collaboration will be. So, we need clarity of purpose, um, that the issues are framed practically so people can understand the practical application of what we're discussing. The people in the conversation are directly impacted. So if, if the outcome of this has a direct impact on me, I'm going to be a lot more invested in a collaborative approach. And if it doesn't affect somebody else in the conversation, why would I wanna collaborate with them? Because it doesn't affect them the way that it's affecting me. Um, it's important for people to have a stake in the solution and that people have the authority to implement those solutions. So if the solution of something is like, I'm going to organize, you know, one community event per month that has no alcohol, but then I'm like not an organizer and I can't organize events, then like that wouldn't be, you know, it's not a good space to be having this collaborative conversation from. Um, it's also important for the necessary people to be in the room. So we don't want to have people in the room who 
shouldn't be in the room. And if people, if people's opinion are going to change uh, the decision that's made, it's important for those people to be in the room because it kind of breaks the trust of the group and it breaks down this kind of collaborative um, frame that you're trying to build. If it's like, hey, we just had this really great collaborative thing. We came to this outcome and oh, that person over there like vetoed it, even though they weren't in this conversation. That's not going to really make me feel like, yeah, I want to engage in this collaborative process with these people. And then trust as well. Um, all right, so let me just check for questions here one more time. And we're going to move on to some, uh, some, some little kind of role plays here. Um, Dan learned that he has very strong opinions on alcohol. <laughs> Yeah, I, that was just a totally random example. Um, and it turned into like the main one that I use this whole time. So, all right. So we're gonna have a little role play and I'm going to ask for six volunteers. And one of the volunteers is gonna be the facilitator and then five people are going to be the people in the group who are talking. Um, and so we're gonna be having a conversation about should DXC work with animal farmers? and the goal of the conversation is to come to a position on this question. So we're actually trying to um, have an outcome of this, like yes or no. Um, and okay, so Dan, yeah, so that's good. So if you want to volunteer to be one of the people in this conversation, you can type a star in the chat. And don't worry if you don't have an opinion, because I'm actually going to give you kind of like a little prompt. It's not a full on script, but it's like, a, it's going to be like your perspective in this conversation is this. So it's, it's kind of like a little mini script type thing. So um, we've got Emma. So we need six people. So I need five more. Rasa. Awesome. Thank you guys for volunteering. I can also volunteer if nobody wants to put on their acting shoes today, but um, you know, this is a safe space. It's, it's no judgment. And the best part is I'm giving you your script. So if you feel like, you know, weird about saying some of this stuff, just you could blame it on me. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So we've got Emma, Rasa, Nancy, Amanda, Susan. How many people is that? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. We just need one more. So I'm going to start by um, messaging some people. Okay, perfect. Danya. Wow. This is like an all, I think, um, all she her conversation so that's cool um so i need one of you to be the facilitator and maybe i'll just pick rasa if that's okay if it's not okay you can let me know in the chat so you're going to be the facilitator rasa and i'm going to send the other people um little uh your kind of little script of like what your role is and i believe some of my lovely tech assistants here are going to unmute you so that you're able to speak um, so Ross is the facilitator and I'm just privately messaging everyone who volunteered a little script except for you Rasa because you know your role as the facilitator so um, I'll be done here in just a second and if you can't see it let me know um, can people hear me Mo says that she can't hear People can hear me. Okay. Okay. Um, cool. So in one of the things I sent, the one that I sent to you, Emma, there's like a weird name in it that says um, Hadley. You can just like think of that as your own name. I came up with like gender neutral names when I like made these little scripts. So sometimes they like say people's names in them, but if it says a name, it's just your um, name. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here so we can go to gallery view and see our lovely volunteers. Um, cool, so it looks like everyone's just about ready to go here. So Rasa, are you able to speak? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right, so um, Ross is gonna be the facilitator and I'll kind of, I'll help you cheat a little bit and I'll give you a tip, but also just cause I'm not sure how it's gonna work if we don't do this is you probably will wanna establish some way for people to say that they wanna be the next speaker.
All right, so if any of our volunteers are not ready to go, let us know in the chat. Um, but if, if we're all ready, Rasa is gonna take it away. Um, Joanne, that there's yeah. a complication that I'm using my iPhone so I can see only four people and they're not the people in the group. So maybe I'll just establish a norm where people have to start speaking. So I'll just work with that challenge. Yeah, and the, the thumbnails on your screen may change as people speak. Usually they kind of move up the Zoom rank as they speak. Okay, cool. Um, let me also remove myself so I can see more people. Um, okay, so what am I supposed to be doing? So you're going to facilitate this conversation of should DXE work with animal farmers and we're just trying to hear everyone's perspective and hopefully get to a place where we can come to some kind of decision together. Okay, cool. Um, sorry. All right. Um, so um, hopefully, so can people first say their names, please? Hi, yeah. hi. Susan. Nancy. Donia. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so one of the norms is that if you'd like to speak, just go ahead and jump in. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, should DXC work with farmers um, in the movement. So um, I'll try not to um, contribute too much of my opinion, but my opinion is that, um, <laughs> I'm worried of starting with my opinion, but my, <laughs> my opinion is that uh, we should collaborate with them. So um, I'll let other people talk. So go ahead and jump in. I think we should talk with other people who are easier to win over, like people who care about cats and dogs, you know, the SPCA types. I think we, it's easier to uh, establish a, a connection with them, like they love their animals and we need to make them see that, you know, what's the difference between your dog and this beautiful little pig over here, you know? Uh, would you like to eat your dog? as the main course and the pig as the, you know, the, uh, um, the side course. And of course they'd be horrified. And, and then you say, well, well, think about that. This is an animal smarter than your dog. It, it, it's very, uh, it, it has tight family bonds. And anyway, I think it would be a lot easier to great idea. talk great to those idea. people instead of a farmer. Yes, I totally agree with that. I, yeah, I'm totally on your side. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing idea. Yeah. So, so just, I just kind of want to throw this out at everybody, but um, um, I've been threatened by farmers and had a close call where actually one of them turned violent during an action. What? Uh, yeah, and so, you know, with that and just, the contact that I've had with these farmers, I believe that they are mentally ill and that as a group, we should advocate for farming to be considered a mental health disorder, but not, not that we should collaborate with them on any projects. I agree. No, I agree with yeah. that. No, totally. Yeah. I agree I'm with that yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that too. I think that, you know, farmers are who we're against in this right? I mean, they are the direct oppressors of the animals. And if we don't take a stand against them, then what do we even stand for? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, I'm sorry. No. Someone, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but I think uh, Julie said she has something to say. So uh, I think, I think let's just keep it to the folks who are in the, like the skit. And then oh, Julie, okay. if you have a question or something, um, we can, uh, we can get to it after. Okay, cool. Sorry to interrupt. So go ahead, whoever was talking. Well, oh, I was just saying that I think that that farmers are horrible, and we should never consider working with them ever. Um, they are like you were saying. They have maybe I don't know if it's mental illness or if they're just not good people, but they are harming the animals, and we can. I mean, abolitionists didn't work with slave masters. There's no reason that we should work with farmers. Right on. No, I'm totally with you. I totally agree with that. There's no way. Yeah, there's no way. Nah. Mm. Good point. I, I actually, 
Uh, well, I, I grew up with um, these kinds of people, you know, like, like in this rural kind of area. And I, 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 my experience is very different. I just felt like, you know, they're, they're just families like everyone else. And, and they also, you know, they, they're part, they're just kind of brought in the system and they're, you know, it's like habit and, you know, their surroundings. So would uh, you use that to justify child abuse too, Nancy? Would you, would you use that to justify child abuse though too? That they were just, that's what they were raised with. They were abused as children. So now they abuse their children and that's okay. Nancy, I agree with you. Everybody. Good point. I, I believe, um, you know, people change and yeah. they can yeah. learn. But we wouldn't use that to justify any other form of abuse. That's true. That's true. Oh man. But I, I don't know if we're justifying it or, or if we're trying to develop um, change ourselves and, and work with those who can change. They can. No, know. I think allying, allying ourselves with murderers is not what we should be doing. But I can't, uh, no, absolutely not. Yeah, we should, we should be talking to just like vegetarians and people who've been thinking about turning vegan, somebody with a foot in the door already. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That way that they're kind of already primed and like ready to go. Yeah. And they just don't know how to do it or they think it'll be too hard and all they need are some suggestions. Yeah, that's a great, I really like that, Susan. That's great. All right, let's yeah. call it scene. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Ooh, that was rough because I don't believe that. <laughs> that <laughs> I was had awesome. to fight against what I really believe. <laughs> Yeah, thanks to everyone who volunteered. Also, Nancy, uh, <laughs> Nancy, I'm sorry if I was really harsh. That was my role. I, no, I know. I, 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 I felt so bad. I had a different <laughs> role. <laughs> Amanda, okay, too. Amanda, Amanda was hilarious. Just agreed with everyone <laughs> that said everything. <laughs> yeah, wrong. so... As a disclaimer, if you joined late or something, these are not their real opinions. This was just a no. skit and they were given prompts of like how they were, were supposed to behave. Um, <laughs> people didn't realize you were playing roles. Yeah, I privately messaged them like little little descriptions. So, um, so yeah, thanks to all of you for participating and you're all welcome to, you know, let, it, let us know this as well. And, and for everyone who was watching, like, let's just spend a little bit of time kind of debriefing like what we saw, what things were problematic, where would we maybe have wanted to intervene if we were the facilitator. And I'm just going to go ahead and mute everyone who was in the scene, but if you want to speak again, um, or if, and oops, if anybody else wants to speak, you could just put a little star in the chat. Um, so yeah, did anyone notice anything? Um, Emma was being really aggressive. Yeah, so Emma was interrupting, um, was kind of, I don't know if it was like, you know, a, a personal attack, but she was kind of attacking people's positions in a way that maybe, um, especially by that point, um, Nancy was the only one who shared a position um, that we should work with farmers. Everyone else, I believe, was kind of against. And so then it was like, Nancy shared this position that um, you know, no one else was really expressing and then got attacked for it. And so it's like, ooh, that's going to make this conversation a kind of unsafe space for Nancy to participate. Um, so yeah, the intolerance of Nancy's opinion. Bailey noticed that Amanda had no opinion and she just made agreement noises and was just agreeing with everyone else's perspective. And yeah, that was another thing. So Amanda was talking a lot, was backing people's positions up, even if they were different positions but didn't state a position of her own. So maybe we'd wanna ask, if we notice that happening, maybe we'd wanna ask like, you know, how do you feel about this? Like just not as a response to anyone, but just, okay, let's, you know, there could have been maybe an opportunity for think, pair, share, or just like think, share. So let's all just take a couple minutes. We notice, you know, okay, this person is just agreeing with everyone. Maybe they don't know how they feel. So let's take a minute and let's just reflect on how we feel and, you know, maybe, hey, like, Amanda, do you want to share anything that you wrote down? And we can, we can give her space to do that. Um, so Max said a lot of talking and arguing that went deep into ideology and strayed from practicality and trying to figure out what to do. So there was a couple times that um, 
people strayed from the conversation. So bringing up, you know, oh, we should bring in people who volunteer with the SPCA, not farmers. Like, that's not the conversation that we're having here. If you don't think we should include farmers, that's fine. But we're not talking about the SPCA today. Maybe that could be the next thing that we talk about. So that would maybe be another spot where we'd want to, um, to intervene. Kathy said, maybe as the facilitator in the beginning, be sure to let everyone know that opinions will be heard and negativity won't be tolerated. And even if you haven't done that in the beginning of a meeting, it's likely that the group already has some kind of norm or value where it's like we respect each other or nonviolence or something like that, that you can kind of point to and be like, hey, you know, um, it's okay to disagree with each other, but we're not going to attack each other here. And we're going to respect each other's positions and just each other as individuals. And so we're not going to interrupt and we're not going to, um, you know, make, make kind of personal attacks. Um, what do you, Donya asked, what do I think about the facilitator deflecting Emma's responses? Um, do you want to say more on that? Oh, I unmuted oh, you. Oh, okay. No, well, I just meant like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> like, that's a lot to type. Um, <laughs> so maybe, maybe just, you know, after, you know, the, sh the ranting kind of goes on a little bit, just kind of as far as um, not changing the subject exactly, but kind of moving on to something else or, you know, a different focus, maybe something like that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great, um, that's actually a great suggestion. So kind of finding out like what is maybe like what's behind that anger and then like maybe let's like kind of redirect so we can address what's making you angry, but not like have you be in this elevated state. Yeah, and definitely letting Emma know that she's heard and, you know, understood, but mm -hmm. then, yeah, kind of moving that on because, I mean, that can be a little rough for, say, example, Nancy, right, who has a different opinion. Yeah, 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 that's great. And, oh, I'm just going to mute you. I can hear myself. Um, and that's, I think, another example of how nonviolent communication can be really, really um, useful as a facilitator. And so, you know, if you didn't hear me the first, like, 10 times on this training, um, nonviolent communication is a great skill to learn more about. Um, because that's really what you're learning to do is learning to make people feel heard and kind of reflect back what they're saying and get down to, like, the needs that people are expressing. So... Um, all right, I'm going to just, uh, we're going to just do one quick thing before we kind of wrap things up for today. And I'll stick around after seven o'clock in case there's questions or um, if people want to do some more acting, we can do more skits or something like that. But um, I just want to do this one final thing before people have to jump off. Um, so I thought we could just take another couple minutes here and just talk about what's going to be hard for you. So we've talked, you know, a little bit about what facilitation is. We've seen some of the things play out of um, what it looks like when when a conversation maybe needs a facilitator and we've talked about some of the things we could do uh, to intervene as a facilitator and I just want you all to take a couple minutes here just to reflect on your personal skills so your weaknesses your strengths your fears um, and just think about what's going to be hard for you or what is hard for you if you have experience with facilitating um, so if you want to write it down um, you're welcome to do that and you know, you're welcome to share in the chat as well, but if you just prefer for this to be an independent reflection, um, just think about what specific things are, are going to be areas where you need to kind of work on. So some people are posting in the chat, um, getting people to come to the meetings in the first place, <laughs> finding a balance between empowering others to lead and taking a direct leadership position. 
cutting someone off when they're too excited, um, but we have time constraints, taking the floor, um, encouraging the voices of shy or quiet people without kind of singling them out, um, reining people in. So a lot of these things, uh, it sounds like some of the things people are sharing are about like kind of that being direct and having to kind of be the be the bad guy or, or step into those awkward situations. And that's definitely like one of the hardest things about uh, being a facilitator. And I think, um, you know, we're kind of raised to um, avoid conflict and it's this uncomfortable thing. And so that's one of the things we need to kind of learn. And it's, it's really something that you kind of just have to learn through experience to, um, to kind of condition that in yourself and, and get a little bit more confident in your ability to just like cut people off and kind of, um, you know, uh, smash the gavel or whatever, whatever they do. Um, so, you know, facilitation is something that we're constantly going to be learning and getting better at, like I said at the beginning. So for some people, you may already be on your facilitation journey, or for some people, this might be the beginning of it. But just because you are seeing some of these things and you're like, oh, that's going to be hard for me. It doesn't mean you can't be a facilitator. It just means now you recognize what areas you need to improve on. And the next time you're in a position where you can facilitate a meeting or something, you can remember like, okay, this person's talking a lot. I need to cut them off. I know that's a really hard thing for me to do. Okay, I'm going to do it. Okay, I need to do it. Here we go. And like, now you can do it. Um, and so, you know, facilitation includes just being aware of your own limitations. And so whether that's stepping back from a conversation that you have really strong opinions on and you are like, I can't, I need to participate in this conversation. I can't facilitate. Or if your limitations are, um, you know, these constraints that you're, that we're talking about in the chat here, like the things that you're feeling are going to be hard for you. Um, you know, just being aware of those um, is, is a way to move past them. And something that's really useful is to learn by watching as well as by doing. So going to other people's meetings or trainings and learning from the, the style of other facilitators. Um, once you're really just observing the facilitator, you can start to be like, oh, they use that, that thing where they made people write down their ideas or, oh, they cut that person off. I'm going to like take a mental note of how they did that. Cause it was really like graceful. Um, and yeah, the other thing is just, you know, you're going to have your own style. Every facilitator is different because we are, we are all different. And so as the facilitator, you're wearing a lot of hats, but you don't need to wear all the hats. And just because one person facilitates conversations in a certain way, it doesn't mean you need to do it in the same way. And so as you get more experience, you'll kind of learn what your style is. And maybe you're not able to just jump in and be super direct and be like, hey, yeah, thanks for sharing. I'm going to need you to sit down. But maybe you come up with some different way that feels more true to who you are to keep people kind of in check and keep the conversation moving. But something that's that's really universal, and even if you're not like a comedian, is is something that can you can really um, kind of that can be useful uh, as, in your role as a facilitator is just having a sense of humor and a bit of lightheartedness. Sometimes, like I said, things are going to go wrong, and as you know, as the person kind of leading this whole charge, it's up to you to just kind of you know relax and be able to breathe through it, and it's if you have a sense of humor about things, if something does go wrong, you'll be able to bring this sense to the whole group about, you know, we can just, we can laugh things off. Not everything has to be super serious all the time. And it's really helpful if someone can kind of bring that, that joy and that energy to maybe sometimes environments that are like high pressure or very tense and really like cheesy things that normally are people like hate, like dad jokes and puns can also be like, they can earn you a lot of points as a facilitator because they just kind of lighten the mood. So um, we've come to the end here and these are kind of, you know, main three points. If you need to write anything down from today, these are the main three ones, which is just continue, you know, learning about this stuff, learn about nonviolent communication. Um, I'm going to share um, this resource sheet that's linked right here. Um, those are the resources that I wanted to share. So you can go there to learn more about some of the different, um, approaches to facilitation that I shared about today and learn by doing. So find ways to apply this information, whether it's like facilitating meetings, or maybe you just want to have a conversation with some people and be like, Hey, let's just talk about this idea. Like, um, you know, as the animal rights movement, should we target like vegans to turn them into activists or should we target people who are already activists, like in other movements and try to get them to like, you know, become anti-speciesist or whatever. Like you could just have a conversation with 
random people or with friends and you could be like, I want to facilitate so I can like fine tune this skill of mine and also get feedback. It's really, really useful. If sometimes when you're the facilitator and you're the one who's kind of in the zone, you're not seeing all of the things because you're trying to like manage so much. So, you know, if you recorded the meeting, maybe if you went back, you'd be like, oh, I should have done that thing differently. But it can be really useful to just have someone else watching to give you some of those pointers that you maybe didn't see or just it's their perspective. They have a different perspective than yours. Um, I also put my email address up here. So if you have any questions, um, you can totally email me. I'm also happy to just like talk to people more about this or if you're like facilitating something and you want someone to give you feedback or if you want to watch me facilitate something and you want to give me feedback, that's cool. Just like email me and we can talk more. Um, so yeah, thanks so much to everyone for coming. I hope this lived up to the name of the, of the title of this presentation. <laughs> and um, also thanks for being the la part of the last ALOA training, at least for now. You know, ALOA is probably going to continue in some way, shape, or form, but um, it's really cool. You all get to say that you were, you know, on the last, the last training of the thing, this thing that we're, we're doing for the first time. So um, thanks to everyone, yeah, for taking some time out of your Thursday night. And um, I will also link my slides on that resources document. It's not there right now, but I know some people were saying they wanted to watch the recording and I'll also share my slides, which also have my script in them. So it's basically the whole thing anyways. Um, and then the recording will, uh, will be shared next week as well. So yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'll stick around for a couple minutes if anyone has questions or wants to like talk more about anything. Um, but yeah, it's great to see you all. And hopefully we'll see many of you on Saturday for the final assembly. And hopefully we'll get to all be together in person soon as well. <laughs> oh, I like that. It's like a virtual hug. Okay, let's all hug each other. <laughs> oh, that was so cute. I love it. All right. Well, have a good night. And uh, yeah, if there's any outstanding questions or anything, um, I'll stick around for a minute or two. Oh, and thanks to Dan, Michael, and Kitty um, also for helping out with tech stuff. Normally I do the tech for other people, so it's been great to have other people have my back. <laughs>